Honeybees amaze me. What a honeybee hive can do is that about 20 to 30,000 bees that are in a single hive, and they manage to keep the temperature of the nest at exactly 34 degrees Celsius, and it's not a degree higher and not a degree lower, no matter what the outside temperature is. Honeybees have developed the waggle dance. So what they do, as you probably know, is they go out and forage, and they look for flowers, and then they come back to the nest, and they tell the other bees where they found something and how, the, how good it is. And they do that with a waggle dance. That's the way of communication. And what happens when the bees need a new nest? There's going to be lots of possible nest sites. And different bees go out and explore and find different options. And then, at some point, the whole hive, together, all move as one to the new nest. It's not that some go some one way and some go another. All collectively, at the same time, off they go. Now, do they follow an overall controller? Do they do what the Queen says, like we do in Great Britain? <laughs> no. In fact, what a honeybee hive does is they have a democratic voting system in place. So when they need a new nest site, they send scouter bees out to look for possible nest sites. These scouter bees come back, and again, they do their little waggle dance, and they tell the other bees how great the site is they found. And that way they recruit other bees to have the same opinion. And once the majority of bees has the same opinion, then the entire hive, and not just that little group, takes off and moves to that new nest site. Now, those aren't bees, they're neurons. Neurons in your brain. Now, you wouldn't think that your brain would have anything in common with a beehive. But you have to make decisions. And experiments suggest that when you make a decision, it's something like what happens in the beehive, in the sense that different neurons get recruited to do one thing or the other. And only when a majority of neurons are all saying the same thing is the decision made. And we can make, play a little game, which is, I'll show you some dots on the screen. And I want you to make a decision. Some of the dots will be moving right, and some of the dots will be moving left. And I want you to decide whether the majority of dots is moving left or right. And once you have made a decision, I want you to raise your hand, and you raise your right hand if you think the majority of dots moves right, and you raise your left hand if you think the majority of dots moves left. So here's a movie. And once, as soon as you've made up your mind, raise your hand. OK. I can see people. some people make the decision very quickly, and some are waiting a little bit. And most of you show left, which is the right answer, but some of you show right, and it's only about 50% dots more are moving to the left than to the right, so it's not an easy decision to make. So we've discovered that a honeybee hive and the neurons in your brain are similar systems. Superficially, very different, and yet they have this feature in common, the way that a decision is made. It didn't feel to you like the neurons in your brain were all going one way or the other, and only when the majority chose one thing did you make the decision. But it seems that's what's happening. Now, what we've learned is that the complexity in these things has an underlying simplicity, and mathematicians and scientists in general have managed to find underlying rules to describe such an overall coordination. And, for example... Sometimes, when people engage in collective action, they are all being told what to do by a boss. So, for example, a herd of horses have a lead mare, and the mare decides where to go, and the other horses follow. But in other systems, it's not like that at all. There is no overall controller. Their coordinated action comes about through some other mechanism. So if you think of a flock of birds, now each bird is an individual organism. There's lots of properties. They have a size, an age, a color, they have a certain hunger level, they have needs, they need to find food, they need to procreate, they need to stay alive. The question is, which one of these properties matter 
when you want to predict the behavior of the entire flock. And it turns out that almost all those properties are completely irrelevant. All that really matters is that each bird obeys two simple rules. One rule is don't get too close to anyone. And the other rule is don't get too far away from your colleagues. So the birds are constantly checking to see where their neighbors are. And if their neighbors are too far away, they fly towards them. And if the neighbors are too close, they fly away. And that's it. And as a result of just each bird obeying those two simple rules, they form this collective entity that can go around an obstacle and reform on the other side of it. And if you take a flock of birds, there are, say, a few hundred birds in such a flock. But there are complex systems that are way bigger than that, and they consist of billions of interactions between many, many, many elements. The brain is such an example. And some of those complex systems are, as we've talked about, natural systems. And as well as flocks of birds, we could talk about shoals of fish, we could talk about insect swarms, and so on. But we've made some of these complex systems ourselves. The financial economy and the internet are complex systems. They have an underlying order beneath the bewildering complexity that we see here. So in this picture, what we're looking at is the connections between nodes in the internet. And what's important, just like with the flock of birds, is this, that they interact. It doesn't matter that birds see where their neighbors are and bats tell where their neighbors are by echolocation. The same behavior, the flocking behavior, emerges just because they're able to tell where their neighbors are. Now, in the internet, the connections could be fiber optic, or they could be microwave, or they could be electromagnetic cables. But What's important is just what nodes are connected to what nodes. And what scientists have done, they've used this, this, if you like, the irrelevance of the precise nature of the interaction, just abstracting all of these systems to a network. You can abstract a beehive to a network. You can abstract, obviously, the internet to a network, the financial economy to a network. And that allows us to find underlying simplicity in terms of mathematical rules for all of these systems. Now, we talked about complex systems that are natural systems, living systems. We talked about the internet and the financial economy. Well, they're not living, but they're made by us. And so you might think every complex system is either a living system or a system that's made by a living system. And we're used to seeing nature, complex systems in nature, produce beautiful structure. So here are some examples. Now, do we see this kind of structure and complexity in non-living systems too? Well, the answer is yes, we do. This looks like it might have been drawn by someone. There's beautiful symmetry. It's a beautiful pattern. And yet it's produced just by a chemical reaction driven by heat between simple molecules. So this kind of complexity shows that Complexity can arise from non-living systems as well as living ones. This is another example. <coughs> People call it the giant's causeway because it's natural to think it must have been built by someone. Look at the structure, look at the, the symmetry, look at the order that's present in this system. And yet we know that simple physical processes produce this as a result of many, many, many interactions. Now, the next image, probably everyone in the audience recognizes, or we're debating whether it's maybe just people above the age of 40. It's an image of the computer game Pac-Man. And, of course, Pac-Man has been programmed by someone. And you might think it needs a complex system to generate a complex pattern. It needs a programmer to generate this. It needs a honeybee hive to generate a honeycomb. But we'll look at a very simple system which doesn't need a complex system to generate any pattern. So in this representation of what's called the game of life, there are structures. You can see static structures that d d uh, show oscillating behavior. You can also get entities that look like Pac-Man. They come along and eat other things, and things called gliders and so on. And when you see some of these things, you think, 
they must have been designed by someone. Someone must have created that oscillating little cross at the top there. But no, this is governed by very simple rules. The rules are roughly, if a cell is too isolated, it switches off. If a cell is too crowded, it switches off. But if a cell is not too crowded, not too isolated, then it stays on or turns on. And just those simple rules, and then the repetition of them over many, many, many cycles will generate a, compl a complexity that almost looks like it's been designed. So what we learn is that the complexity in these systems is actually the result of many, many interactions. And it's just that we find it difficult to imagine what the structure will be that arises from these many interactions, which really follow very simple rules. And the reason that scientists have begun to be able to predict such behavior in complex systems is because they have the help of computers with more and more power. And what we begin to see is the different layers of complexity in these systems. We have the layer of many individual actions leading to a coherent decision. We have the layer of order arising from purely physical and chemical interactions. And we have the layer of coherent social behavior, which comes about only through very simple individual rules of behavior. And one of the systems where all of these layers at the moment are being put together is in the study of cities. A city is an incredibly complex system, and like lots of complex systems, it's a complex system that's made of other complex systems. Your body is like that too. Each of your cells is an incredibly complex system. Your body is a complex system that's made of all of those. And in your body, there's flows of energy, flows of waste products, flows of nutrients, flows of information. And it's a bit like a city, because in the city too, there has to be flows of information, energy, food, and waste, transport. Now, if we look at cities in the right way, we can start to see a simplicity underlying the bewildering complexity of the hubbub of city life. Because what we can do, again, is abstract away all of these interactions that happen, the different flows of energies, communication, phone calls, bus rides. We abstract that, again, into a network. And then we start to see patterns similar to the patterns that we observe in systems in the biosphere. And it allows us to actually predict things about cities. So, for example, we can predict the income statistics of a city purely given its size. We can predict the number of petrol stations of a city purely given its size. And the reason are the simple mathematical rules underlying all of that complexity. So, this is a representation of Sao Paulo, and there, there the people are communicating in Spanish, but here we're communicating in English. But what's really important for many of the characteristics of the city is just that the people are communicating. It doesn't matter what language they're speaking. What's important is that energy is flowing around. Not so important exactly what form that energy is taking. So when we think about complex systems in the right way, we can abstract from some of their features and understand the simplicity that underlies the wonderful complexity that they display. Thank you.